Yo, Wiz, man, turn it down, baby. Live from Atlanta, Georgia. That's right, man. I put on for my city. Hey, I got one of the most amazing guests in the world today, man. This is one of my player partners, my friends, man. He's only one call away, man. Yo, he just can't wait to be king. He's the American dream. You know what I'm saying? You done seen him on Thea. You, he, yo, he's an ATL legend, even though he ain't from ATL. He hails from Chicago. Mm. Yo, I'm talking about my man. Jason Weaver. What up, Jack? <laughs> From the shot. From Represent. the group home. Represent, man. Yo. I'm so happy to be here, man. Man, I'm so happy you here, bro. It's a, it's an honor. It's, it's been a long time coming. We've been trying to make this happen. I was like out of town for a minute, then I came back. But, you know, anytime you got something going on, Jack, you know I'm always going to show up, man. So hey, thank you for having me. Listen, let me tell you something, man. Your <laughs> song, One Call Away, like you answer on the first ring for your dog. <laughs> for and, sure. For yeah, sure. no, you you was on a hot date with a young lady and everything, and you you and you 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 was macking and talking to me at the same time and said no diggity, no doubt, Jack. Hey, man, you, you got I'm you got to keep it player. Let's do it. You got you got to keep it player. No, I mean when, whenever I see your name pop up, man, um, like I said, I always pick up the phone because first and foremost, I respect you uh, for the man that you are, and of course for the for the entertainer that you are. There's a lot of work that I want to do with you in the future, too. So, you know, this is just all about friendship, man, and about us supporting one another as black men and, you know, trying to help each other out as, as we are uh, going along on this journey. Hey, man, let me let me give him a little background real quick, man. Mm -hmm. So let me let me tell you something um, about what Jason Weaver means to me. And um, at the time, I think I'm, I probably was in the fifth grade. And I was uh, living in a battered women's shelter with my mom, mm. and so you already know what that particular that means. She was going through some domestic situations, and it was a movie that came on with one of my childhood heroes and lifetime heroes, uh, the, his his life story, Michael Jackson. Mm. And you played <laughs> young Michael Jackson, and I saw this inside this battered women's shelter at ten years old mm. and whatnot, and. Nobody couldn't tell me that you wasn't Michael Jackson. Oh, man, thank you. You know man. what I'm saying? And then on top of that, I, I, I went on to see you um, in The Lion King mm -hmm. a couple of years later, mm -hmm. you know, when I joined Cub Scouts. That's right. You know, and, uh, you know, we were watching it on uh, um, on, on VHS mm -hmm. at a Cub Scout camp out and everything. And I recognized the voice and everything. Yo, it, it was instilled in my mind. I was like, Michael Jackson is Lion King. <laughs> then, you know, yeah. after that, yeah. you know, it's Thea. Yeah. It's Thea. You know, yeah. you, you you was not Brandy's little brother, but Brandy's big brother. Yep. Brandy's big brother in that yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then you did, went on to do more things. And then you did ATL. And yeah. you know what I'm saying? You, you have a host of credits, man. Credit after credit. And, you know you're not just a TV singer because most people they, they sing on TV but they not singers like mm -hmm. like for instance I love Leon to death and he's played every body that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. body that's yeah. uh, oh, one of the greatest singers alive you just choose him mm -hmm. and um you know not to say he can't hold a note mm -hmm. but he ain't put out no album nah that's real that's Hold right. on, but he, he, he do got a band or something, right? No, he actually, I think Leon, because because I follow him on Instagram. Shout yeah. out to Leon. Leon puts on, he, yeah. he has a, he uh, a live band, and yeah. I think he goes around New York City, around Manhattan, yeah. and does shows. And from what I heard, they, they're really good. From what yeah, I heard. He, he's amazing. Yeah. He sells, he, and he might as well. Yeah, he might as well. I mean, he's an all-around, all you know, renaissance man. He acts. I think at one point in time, he modeled. Mm. Um, you know, he sings. I think mm. he may even play. Mm. So no, nah, man, it, there are a lot of uh talented um you thespians. know actors, you know, thespians and people like that that mm. that have multiple things that they could do, like myself and Leon. So shout out to all the entertainers out there that you know, make it happen in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then uh, yo, even my man that uh played Joe Jackson. Oh, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. My he's dog. so unsung. He's so unsung, bro. Man, you see him in great. everything. He's great, man. Lawrence, you know what I'm saying? Or Larry, as I call him. Man, he doesn't really get the credit, I think, that he that he rightfully deserves, man. Lawrence Hilton Jacobs has been, you know, on our TV screen since, like, Cooley High. Cooley High. You know what I'm saying? Putting it down for the culture. And uh, 
on top of him, you know, just being a phenomenal actor and an absolute pleasure to work alongside with on that show, he's a great person, man. He was, he really was there um, as a mentor, served as a mentor to all of the young men that were on the Jacksons at that time. Because we were all young, including uh, Terrence Howard. Terrence, I was just Jackie. about to bring him up, bro. Terrence Howard was in that. But at that time, I think Terrence was like, maybe 20, 21. Yeah. So all of us were like, you know, kids mm. um, involved in this amazing project. And, mm. you know, Larry was definitely there to, to help guide us along the way and provide insight, encouragement, you know, motivation. Man, it was, same with Angela Bassett, man. That, that whole experience was just the shit. Did you understand that, though, at the time when it was happening? Like, like oh. who they were and how much it meant to, like, to uh, the culture and – Yeah. Or, or were you just – were you just a good kid? No, no. Because it ain't nothing wrong with just being a good, respectable kid. No, I've, I've, I've always been blessed, man. I was a blessed child. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Just Say keeping that. it real. Um, now, that being said, I was a regular kid like everybody else. So there were, there were moments, of course, where my mother had to check me, you know what I'm saying, and put me in line, you know, with certain things, as, as everybody did during their upbringing. But I understood at a very early age when I really began to start um, working consistently as a professional, that I was in a, in a very unique uh, position. And so I never, um, I never took that for granted and I never treated it like, you know, it was just something that was an everyday thing. And, you know, the confirmation for that definitely was working on the Jackson's miniseries. I mean, you know, the auditioning process to play Michael um, was very strenuous and hectic in itself because there were kids auditioning literally from all over the world for that one role uh, within that age group and then um, going through that process of casting and then, um, you know, being flown out to Los Angeles and having to audition in front of the directors and the writers and the producers and the Jackson family. And then after that, then Michael getting like the last three, you know, uh, select candidates that the family felt strongly about in casting and the producers then those going to him and then him ultimately having to make the final decision. I mean, man, by the time I got on set, um, I knew that I was there for a reason, uh, that, you know, I was I was following in my purpose. I, I didn't call it then, but I knew that I was there for a reason. And so I really wanted to make sure that I took full advantage of the situation. I wanted to make sure that I was on my P's and Q's at all times because I knew that there was always some other kid or somebody else waiting in the wings ready to replace me. So there was really no time to play around and there was no time to focus on the pressure of it all. The only thing you could focus on was executing. And that's all we did literally seven days a week, damn near for five months straight. I mean, seriously, we rehearsed on our days off. That was something that we willingly did, voluntarily did as cast members, even you know after we would rehearse on Saturdays and after weeks long of shooting on Sundays, we would still get together in a room similar to this one with a mirror and we would rehearse and prepare for Monday. So it was not a fucking game at all. And I think, um, you know, thankfully at the end of the day, that work, uh, that work ethic that was, you know, placed into that, uh, that, that amount of dedication and commitment to what we were there to do, I think, you know, translated over well on the screen and, and was able to resonate and connect with the viewers. And I think to this day, and it's, it's one of the, uh, the reasons why that mini series is, is still respected and still appreciated and enjoyed by families all over the world today, even with it. Hey, what's up? This your boy, Jack Thriller, man. And uh, you know, whenever I'm trying to rise to the occasion and really put my stamp on that tramp, <laughs> I'm going with Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable tablet at a fraction of the cost. You know, Blue Chew makes it look like I'm running a train on a girl, but it's really just me by myself. You know, it's the better version of myself. And, uh, you know, if you sign up today, you know, you get 10% off with my promo code at bluechew.com slash thriller. You know, some of our licensed uh, medical providers, they're right on tap. It's easy. It's online. It's discreet. Hey, and yo, it's, it's cool. Bluetooth.com. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, it was it, amazing experience. And and that being said too, and this this goes out to the Jackson family. If y'all ever see this, you know, thank y'all so much. Uh, thank you to Mrs. Jackson. Thank you to Joe Jackson. You know, God rest his soul. Thank you to Jermaine, uh, Margaret Maldonado, his wife at the time, Suzanne DePass. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, and most importantly, Michael, um, you know, God rest his soul. I really, really appreciate him for giving a kid from Chicago a shot because he didn't have to do that. It did not have to go down that way. There were so many other kids uh, who were going hard for that role, but he chose me and I appreciate him for doing that. Real talk though, real talk though. Cause that, that's really, I had done films prior to that and I had been in television projects prior to that. But that was the first project that, you know, really um, gave me the opportunity to showcase all of the talent that I've been blessed with, you know, on a very big stage. And uh, that's what really, you know, I would say kick-started my career to where I was, I've been able to work consistently after that. So yeah, I, I owe a lot to, to Michael and the Jackson family. I really, really do. First and foremost to God, of course. Um, absolutely, but you know, at the same time, um, you know, my mother who was there, who prepared me for the role to audition, uh, and then ultimately the, the Jackson family and Suzanne DePass and Mr. Gordy and everybody for supporting me throughout that whole situation. Man, that, that that's one of the most inspirational, amazing stories. And it was definitely 30 years ago. It was 30? Like, yeah, because okay. I'm 40 now. Okay. So yeah, I, and I'm 43. I was, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I I was uh, definitely 10 yeah. when it happened. And I was yeah, I was 13. Yeah. Oh oh, you okay? So, yeah. I ain't tripping. Yeah, I was 13. Yeah, dig dig dig. Um, you know, one of the things that stood out about that movie too, when on your part, mm -hmm. was oh, when you did the national anthem. And this ain't the first time I'm gonna talk about this mm -hmm. um, tonight, because mm -hmm. you know, music soul child coming a little bit later. Okay. And um. I always wanted to sing the national anthem. Okay. You know, when you learn, you had to learn the national anthem on the airplane as Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and and I, I never knew the national anthem. You never knew it? I never knew it. And I ain't know it till I had to do it. <laughs> the situation is, and I put this on Instagram too. Okay. Um, D uh, Tank, he was, uh, we was at a charity mm -hmm. basketball event. Okay. And he was supposed to sing the national anthem, okay. but he, I think he, he wanted to like, you know what I'm saying, 10 grand or 20 grand or some shit to do it. <laughs> okay. And then they was like, man, is anybody else want to do this shit? Uh, I was like, I'll do it. You volunteered? I volunteered to do it. And I didn't even know, I was hating. That was, that, that was me hating. I didn't know I was being a hater. No, I didn't think you were being a hater. You just stepped up to the plate, man. I, I, Tank didn't want to do it. Somebody had to do it. He needed the money. He wanted. He wanted, he wanted no, the money. He wanted the he money. He wanted the money. And yes. I'm not mad at because that is Tank. He's a phenomenal vocalist. If you're gonna get the national anthem from Tank, you are gonna get a fucking performance. You are gonna get a performance. So I get it. But you stepped up to the plate. I was just bullshitting though. Did you fuck it up? Did you know the? Man, I fucked it up. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I I wanted to sing the national anthem uh -huh. and everything, and I forgot a couple of parts. But I, I did a couple of parts right on there. Okay. And he critiqued me in the locker room after the game. Oh, we did? Yeah, because somebody okay. recorded it. They sent it to us, okay. and we watched it on the phone. It's on my Instagram, and okay. you can check it out. But I'm telling you, when, when, they, when they called my name for real to come sing this shit, yeah. and next coming to sing the national anthem, Jack Thriller, I'm like, oh, shit, this is my man. Oh, Jack so you was bullshitting, and then they really called you they on really your bluff? They called me. It was a packed gym. I'm mad I missed uh, Jaylen that. Jalen Rose was in there, all kind of Oh, um, yeah, Jalen Rose in there. Oh, you was out there looking crazy, looking dog. Looking crazy. But, yo, the, the fact that I was Jack Thriller, yeah. and people were familiar with, with me you were able it was able to gloss over it was able to go off okay and okay. people they didn't know that i was gonna sing that through and i hit some notes that they were impressed with oh really yeah i hit some notes that they were impressed with because i hold a note okay i'm not a singer like jason weaver but you can hold a note i can hold a note matter of fact i'm actually uh, working on a um uh, uh, a comedy album right now r&b comedy album with rl that's dope. You yeah. know what? And it's funny. I think you had mentioned that to me the last time we yes. hung out that yes. you were going to do that. Yes, I got to let you hear some songs. It's jamming? It's jamming. For real? I'm the one. 
Am I yeah. gonna get on it? You gonna let your boy get on it? I was gonna ask you about that shit. I ain't gonna even lie. No. But since you brought it up. Yeah. Man, let me get on that shit, man. Since you brought it up. No, let's have some fun. I mean, cause no, music, music is a is a big uh music is a big deal for me. You know what I'm saying? To this day. Man, I come I come from a musical family. Here, here's the funny part man, about man, it. Man, can you give them give them that musical family roller dance real quick? Nah, thing, real real talk. Flex so, on the ass. So my my family now we hail from Chicago. Um, my my mother and my aunts, my grandfather, and my grandmother, they're all originally from here though, from Atlanta. So they migrated up uh, during the Great Migration because my grandfather was a pastor. And they, uh, the church put him in charge of a church called First Progressive on the south side of Chicago. And my mother and my aunts grew up singing in the choir. My, my grandmother was the choir director, the musical director. And so my family grew up harmonizing, singing gospel, things like that. Eventually, um, Chicago became kind of like a hub for uh, jingles in like, I say like the late, 70s and uh, early 80s up until maybe like the mid 90s. So like major advertising campaigns uh, that were put together on Madison Avenue in New York, the jingles and the commercials for those campaigns that were, that were brought up in New York and constructed in New York, all of the creative end of those campaigns was done in Chicago. So the majority of the time, it'd be local talent from the city um, that was producing the jingles, singing the jingles, writing them, you know, performing them um, as musicians and as well as uh, vocalists. And so that's how me and my family like came up. So myself, uh, my cousin Tricky Stewart, um, Tricky Stewart, your cousin, multi <laughs> multi Grammy Award winning producer. He, as a matter of fact, congratulations, Tricky. His latest hit, "Break My Soul," with Beyonce. That's crazy. That's his second that, one. That's crazy. That's that's his second one with Beyonce because he has single ladies with Beyonce as this, well, and he also did uh, "Umbrella for Rihanna," some of his most notable uh, hits that he's been a part of. But he's been making hit records for like twenty five years. Um, my cousin Koo Carell also came up under that same system. Accomplished multi Grammy award winning um, music and vocal producer. Uh, is working on with Rihanna right now. Her new album works with Cher, Jennifer Lopez. The list goes on and on and on. He worked on the Avatar soundtrack. I mean, I come from a family of just extremely talented uh, individuals. And I mean, that's not only including, you know, my, my mother and my aunt's accomplishments. My, my mother, Kitty Haywood, her sister, Ann Stewart, um, my uh, late aunt, Vivian Harrell, uh, and my cousin Cynthia Harrell, uh, back in the day, were in a group called Kitty in the Haywoods and was signed to Mercury Records and Capitol Records. They were discovered by Curtis Mayfield. Wow. Um, and as a matter of fact, you wow. can hear my mother and my aunts, for people that don't know, but I'm, I'm shouting out my mother and my family because I you love better. them so much and I'm so proud of them. I can't shout out my mom on nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they, if you listen to Giving Him Something He Can Feel on the Sparkle soundtrack with Aretha Franklin, that is my mama and my aunts in the background. They sang backgrounds on that whole soundtrack, and that was kind of entryway into the the music industry. Yep. And so that's that's how we that's how I came up um, was through them, through the foundation, you know, and the path that that the, they the, laid. What about the Braxtons, man? The Braxtons. I mean, those are uh, close family friends. I've known the Braxton family since uh, when I was like thirteen, when my cousin Tricky was working with the Braxtons. They were signed, signed to LaFace Records. Mm -hmm. That's how I know uh, Tamar, Tawanda, um, Tracy, God rest her soul. Um, you know, that's how I know that, that whole family because mm -hmm. that whole LaFace um, connection when my cousin moved down here mm -hmm. with an artist uh, that was signed to him by the name of Sam Salter. Sam Salter, God rest his soul. He just recently passed, unfortunately. Sam Salter is dead? Sam passed, man. Sam passed about um six or seven months ago in Get los angeles the yeah out of here. yeah sam was a, a really good friend of mine very uh, he was basically an extended uh, member of our family i've i known sam since uh he first got his deal on the face records and when they all came down here to atlanta georgia from los angeles and uh they were my cousin uh tricky and his partner at the time my other cousin sean hall 
were working on Sam's first album. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then um, you know after their relationship dissolved, Sam went back out to Los Angeles to continue working as a artist and a songwriter. We had continued to you know stay in contact even up until um, maybe maybe like a year or so before he passed because um, I hadn't been out to Los Angeles like that. And that was like during COVID in the whole nine. So everybody was just kind of, you know, like at home. So that that's when it basically happened. And I think that's why a lot of people weren't really aware um, of his passing, except for like his devoted fans. Cause you know, everybody was hunkered down and just trying to survive during the pandemic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, rest in peace to Sam Salter. For those people who may not be familiar with, with, the, uh, with the artist and with the man, he was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant R&B artist who was like really one of the first artists on the Face Records um, who originally hailed from Los Angeles, California. And he was he was something else. He was a great guy on top of being a phenomenal artist. So rest in peace, Sam. Love you, brother. And uh, yeah, that's our history. Yo, Jason, uh, you talked about something that I really want people to know that I ain't never heard you talk about before. Mm. Now, before... Um, you played the legendary role of Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. little Michael Jackson and whatnot. You did things before. Yeah. Can you tell them those things that you did before that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, my first feature film, as a matter of fact, was called The Long Walk Home, uh, which starred Whoopi Goldberg and Sissy Spacek. And it was about uh, two families during the uh, Montgomery bus boycott or like, you know, kind of like the kickoff to the civil rights movement. And I played Whoopi Goldberg's uh, youngest son. The, the character's name was uh, Franklin Cotter. And we shot in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, this was in 1989. It was my first film. Um, and I had the honor of working with Whoopi, Ving Rhames, Erica Alexander, who was on uh, Living Single, um, Sissy Spacek, uh, legendary actress. Uh, who else? Oh, there's so many people in that film. Erica Alexander, that's Maxine, right? Yeah. She hey, played my sister. I, I was so in love with Maxine. Oh, yeah. Everybody <laughs> oh, was. Oh, my God. Yeah. Everybody was. Because, I mean, Erica's a beautiful woman. so She's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. And a, and a phenomenal actress, brilliant actress. Yeah. So I totally get it. Yeah. Um, I, I think immediately after that, I did a, a French film uh, that we shot in Missouri called Miss Missouri. It's like a foreign film. But that really didn't get any kind of. Um, you, you speak? French? Hell no. Nah. I mean, we we shot it in uh in English. The star of the film was like this big time French movie star at the time. He was like France's answer to like Dustin Hoffman. At least that's how it was described to me at the time. <laughs> that's what it. We got amazing film for you. Yeah, yeah, but but it was actually cool though because that gave me the opportunity to work with an actor from overseas and, and essentially work from a crew from overseas at a very young age. So that, you know, although it wasn't like a commercially successful film in that regard, mm -hmm. um, it did help me as far as developing as a professional mm -hmm. because I was thrust in this environment where hardly anybody really spoke any English mm -hmm. and we were there to like shoot a film together. And so it, it kind of like prepared me to be able to adapt to whatever, you know, moving forward with different projects that I would work on. Mm -hmm. It prepared me mentally to be able to adapt to whatever environment that I was in. Mm -hmm. So that film was actually just an exercise in professionalism. So looking back in retrospect, I'm glad I did that film because right after that, I was blessed to work on um, not the mini series, The Women of Brewster Place, but there was a series adaptation to that mini series just called Brewster Place that was done on ABC. And um, I was on that show. I was one of the series regulars uh, on that show alongside with Oprah. We shot that in Chicago on the west side at Harpo Studios. Um, had the honor and the privilege of working alongside with her. Shout out to Deleon Richards. Uh, Deleon Richards was on that show with me. Phenomenal gospel uh, singer, vocalist. She played my sister on the show. Um, yeah, that experience of working with Oprah. Man, let me tell y'all something. Anybody out there, aspiring actors, actresses, whatever, writers, produce, if you have the opportunity to work with Oprah Winfrey, do it. Sorry. Do it. Do that shit. Working with Oprah Winfrey was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life and my career. You got to explain this why. Man, because. It, she gave you, she gave us money. She gave you a call on the set. 
<laughs> well, well, no, it, it wasn't just about the money, man. I mean, because we did get paid well. We were compensated well for for the work we did. But it was what she represents, and even especially what she represented at that time, mind you. This is a hugely successful black woman who opens up a full studio on soundstage in the West Loop of Chicago, which at that time was underdeveloped. It was like called the meatpacking district. So there was nothing over there but like butcher shops and like wholesale fruit markets. And it was like a less than desirable area. And when she came over there and built that studio, Oprah, in my opinion, and I think many Chicagoans would agree with it, is responsible for kickstarting the West Loop of Chicago, which is now one of the most like successful areas in the city, filled with restaurants, clubs, everything. Oprah kicked that off. So to see a black woman doing that, owning her own studio right then and there, she's shooting the Oprah show on one side, shooting Brewster Place on the other side, all of these people revolving around her at her beck and call. On top of that, She's taking the time to communicate with us, the black children that are on the set. And I mean, when I say communicating with us, I'm not just talking small talk. I'm talking how you doing in school. Cause our, our uh, classroom was right next to the makeup room. So before she would come in the makeup room, she would come in the classroom and sit down and ask us and ask the teacher how we were doing in school and would ask us about our studies, would ask us about things outside of being entertainers. It was real like dialogue that she was having with us to prepare us for the world as just young black children, whether we decide to stay in a business or not. It was a lot of insight, it was a lot of wisdom that she shared with us that I still carry with me to this day that had absolutely nothing to do with acting. Um, even as far as understanding my knowledge of self as a black man, the first time I, and the only time I ever met Alex Haley was when Oprah Winfrey introduced me to him that's on the set. Crazy. And he sat there. No, he, that was a flex. Now that's flex, a flex. Flex, but let me, let me tell you what she that's did. That's a flex. Let me tell you what she did. And I had no idea how significant that this was when I was, when I was that age, right? She brings Alex Haley in. This is after work. Roots Alex Haley. Roots Alex Haley. <laughs> Autobiography of Malcolm X. Alex Autobiography okay. of Malcolm. I own that book to this day. I, I own both of them. Like phenomenal reads. He was a phenomenal man. Yes. I, anyway, this man, she brings him to set after we wrap from work. She sets a, a chair in the middle of the set, and everybody has like this semicircle formed around him. She introduces him, and she asks him, "I want you. Uh, please explain." to everyone here your life story. Share with them your life story, your experiences. Share here with all of these beautiful black people that you have here that's on this set, you know, what it was like making Roots. It was for us to walk away with something other than just a paycheck. And that's why I said, if, if any of you guys out there are ever fortunate enough to get the opportunity to work with Oprah Winfrey, man, do it because you'll walk away with more than just you know, the experience of trading lines with her on set. And it's really like a life-changing experience, you know, working with her. It really is. Now, I was just about to ask you, like, who are some people that you've been on set with? And then when you had, when you put Oprah out there, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was the pinnacle. But when you put Alex Haley out there, that, you it, know, that that's like... No, it was, it was incredible, that man. Was, that's super ill. Oh, it's ill. I mean, and, and you know... Whoopi did that for me when I did that's, um, that. That was ill. Home. That was ill. Oh no, bro! I've had your some life is kind of crazy, man. man. I've, I've had, your life is super crazy, hey, man. Hey, man, God has been walking with me since I jumped out the womb. So bro. you know that, and you you like you 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 really acknowledge that. Oh, every day and every opportunity I can get, like I know I'm here because of God, Jack. I've I've been in some rooms. <laughs> And I've been around some people throughout the course of my life okay. and my career where I've even sat there sometimes and been like, holy shit, what is going on? What am I doing here right now? What really? keeps you so humble, man? Like, I, you ain't you ain't never flexed on me. Not, not, not even the first time I ever met you. Well, you know what it is, like, Jack? Like, like I, I, you always want to meet, you know what I'm saying, somebody that you... You super look up to mm -hmm. and everything. And I remember being super timid and super um, 
you know, uh, uh, insecure about yeah. coming up to you, even though I go on stage in front of, you know what I'm saying, the hundreds of people at, mm-hmm. at the time uh, at Uptown Comedy Club and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I, when, I, when I saw you outside of this uh, Shouty Low album release party, <laughs> da, you just chilling outside with the thugs and shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it was a lot of gangster shit going on that night. It was a lot of gangster shit going on. I was mm-hmm. like, man, hey, man, I got to go talk to this nigga. I don't care yes. if he diss me or not. Nah. And if he do diss me, I'm not going to like you. Yo, I've had nah. I've had people diss me, yeah. and I didn't like them any less. Yeah. You know, because I understand that you can't, I, I, at a young age, mm-hmm. young age, mm-hmm. you can't expect you out of somebody else. That's true. But here's what I say, though, Jack. And, and, it, and it's for any entertainer out there, if you are blessed to get to a point where you're recognized in the street or your work is recognized and respected and someone takes the time out to acknowledge you, man, show that love back because first and foremost, that person didn't have to come up and acknowledge you. That person didn't have to take time and look at your work. Um, it's a blessing what we're able to do. You know, I I don't know the exact percentage or the statistic, but to be a working, successful actor, I mean, that's a rarity, man. There are only so many people that get the opportunity to live in that kind of blessing. And so when you recognize that, when you realize that, when you've seen so many people, especially too, as I have throughout the course of my, what, 30 plus years of being in this business, man, I've seen them go up and I've seen them go down. I've seen them come, I've seen them go. And a lot of the times when you've seen that kind of movement in a person's career is because at some point they lost touch with what they got involved in it for in the first place. At some point in time in that journey, they forgot what it was about and they made it all about them. And when you get so caught up in ego, which is edging God out, as far as I'm concerned, when you get caught up in ego and it no longer becomes about the, or it's no longer about the journey, and your, the connection, recognizing the blessing that you have coming from God and the importance of the, the connection that you establish him with audience and fans. It, as soon as you forget that, that's when the blessing is taken away. That's when it begins to slowly kind of disintegrate and you won't recognize it happening around you until you look around one day and go, man, holy shit. And I've seen that happen a lot of times with a lot of different actors, friends of mine, peers, um, people that you thought would never get to that point in their career where they would quote unquote hit rock bottom, but I've seen it happen. And it's all because they forgot, they forgot. And the one thing that I try not to do is ever forget where I come from, where my blessings come from, what I'm doing this for, who I'm doing this for, I never. I try my best never f- to forget it, and I. I think that's one of the main reasons why I'm able to still um, navigate and move around, not only in this business but in this life. I'm still here, 43 years old, because of that. Not even anything having to do with success of being in business. I'm still here a lot because I embrace that philosophy. So when it comes to even our interaction and other performers that I meet, whether you're known, recognizable, or whether you're some cat up off the street that's just getting his feet wet. And if you come up to me respectfully, if you come up to me respectfully, I will acknowledge you respectfully. And that's just how I, that's just how I keep it a stack as a man. Come to me with respect, I'll treat you with respect. And if you, and if you have any questions, and if I'm in a position at that time to answer whatever questions that you may have, or to provide any kind of insight or wisdom that I'm able to share. If I'm able to do it at that time, I'll do it with you. Cause somebody did it for me. There were people that did it for me. So no, I'm not on that shit. I'm not on that. This is, this is something we're all in this together. This business, this life, we're all in this together. We're here to enhance and help one another through conversation, through action, but we all in this together. And it's universal law, and it, and it all goes around in a circle. And I think if you just keep that shit at the forefront of your mind, whether you're in the entertainment industry or you're involved in anything else, anything else that you aspire to do and become, you'll always be successful because your heart and your mind is in the right place and your spirit is in the right place. So that's, that's what I come from. You dig?
Sorry, and I, and I don't mean to be so boring, and I don't want this to sound like a Sunday sermon. No, it so don't, So you want to turn up, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, hey, 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 are we turned up, y'all? Y'all enjoying this? No, nah, man, because you know Carlos, man, when I saw that episode with Los, man, he he had me cracking up. That was a really entertaining episode. Shout out to Carlos, too, man, from 85 South. Hey, hey. That so was so funny. You seen I was just on the 85 South show. Uh, yes, that was funny, too. You, you saw we brought you up. He said he got to have you on the show. I would love to. You coming on 85 South show, man, right? Man, I would love to, man. I'm such a big fan of those guys, man. I, I look at, you know, all their content. Um, I actually ran in the D.C. Young Fly uh, over there um by us man where is that um uh, so on the west side west end yeah because yeah. uh my boy has a barber shop over there and i guess he comes through there every so often so when i was waiting to get in the chair to get my hair cut he comes walking in we hit it off he dc is a great guy man a super great guy super great guy i mean that that whole crew i mean i i, I correspond with los every once in a while via dm um, you know, on social media, I think what those guys are doing, all, all of you guys, let me say this, um, you know, that even goes for Ronnie Jordan and all those guys and Tyler Chronicles and all those guys, man. Um, what, what you gentlemen are doing and even ladies that are involved in this, whether it's podcasting or having shows and platforms like this, man, you guys are so appreciated for what y'all are doing, for what you all are doing and what you all are providing, the platform that you're providing because it's given us, it's given us an opportunity as mm. black performers and artists and actors and actresses. We're not able to get on the Jimmy Kimmel's. We're not able to get on the, uh, you know, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Stephen Colbert and all those. Mm. Man, you guys are providing a platform for us where we can still connect with our people and with our audience. And you're doing it in a way where it doesn't fit the conventional mold. It's entertaining. It's funny. And you get, and I, I genuinely laugh when I look at all y'all on y'all's different shows and platforms. And I just want to let you know, and, and all the rest of the guys out there that are doing the same thing, man, I'm proud of y'all. Salute to y'all. Thank you guys for supporting people like myself, you know, to where I could continue to go out here and, you know, kind of share my stories and my experiences and what I'm doing in my career. Man, like I said, it's just, it's all a circle. So we all help one another, man. So I'm just... I'm happy for y'all. I'm happy for all of us just being in this moment and us realizing the power that we have as black people in this space creatively to where we can create our own opportunities and where we can help and uplift each other. So cheers to y'all. Yeah. Hey, man, I want to talk about your mama, man. Sure. Um, like, when when I think about what, everything that you've said thus far, mm -hmm. man, this ain't nothing that just start with what you want. Right. It had to be on the same token what she want. I I, I can hear the Joe Jackson inside of her. No, now, no, 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 no. When I say that, when I, when, I, when, I, when I think of, when I think about Joe Jackson, I don't think I don't believe he was abusive. Like okay, like like you you played Michael Jackson before, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. You, you, the the rumors that you probably heard, or mm -hmm. the things that you know, mm -hmm. might be a little bit more in touch and more realistic than mm -hmm. the things that the you know the the the, the status quo or the general public knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You did. Mm -hmm. I think Michael Jackson would probably get some regular degular ass whoopings, <laughs> and he thought he was so spoiled that he thought he was getting killed. Well, I, I say this from, and it's not just his account, but it's from the account of the other family members. He he was a very strong and strict disciplinary. Let's let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, uh, respectfully, I think uh, you know maybe what people have to factor in with that kind of thing is like this is in the '60s. You know, Joe was working at a steel mill in Gary, Indiana, and he had some talented ass kids. And he was like, "Man, we need to get the fuck up out of here. Start singing, nigga." <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I just say Joe, we're just ready to go and live out that American dream. Now, the way that he went about doing it. Um, the way he was perceived or, uh, or de I, depicted. I think I think if you talk to, and this is with all due respect for the family, I won't get that deep into it, but yeah. I think if you ask them, mm -hmm. 
they would probably relay over to you that it probably could have been done a little bit differently. Mm. I think they understand and respect and appreciate the fact that Joe um, challenged them to ra rise to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, but if if you ask some of them, I'm pretty pretty sure some of them would say, "Well, I appreciate what he what he did, but it probably could have been done differently, maybe." And and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Jackson family. Hey, hey, That's hey, just my no, no. perception. You know what Jason, I'm saying? From what I, I was I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know what I mean? But I didn't had some of the best ass whoopings in the world. Me too. I I'm didn't have some ass whoopings. I've been thrown through windows and. Oh, uh, I ain't never had that shit. Yeah, I've been. Uh, that, that's abuse, nigga. Water hole. <laughs> and you get thrown out of windows. Yes, at, 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 at once again at ten. I, I told God, you. I saw oh. you in the bad women show. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's I, abuse, yeah, yeah. I went. I, I was fucked up when I was, yeah. saw the movie with you. Got you, got you. Yeah, yeah. that's serious. Yeah it, yeah, it didn't just stop at my mom. I was like, he didn't stop at her. Oh, he, man. It, it was for everybody. It was oh, enough yeah, ass whooping for everybody. That's crazy. I'm sorry yeah. you went through that, too. That's man, that's horrible. It, I, I suffer from a seizure every now and then, but I'm straight. Mm. Um, But what I, what I was saying was, I, if I had an opportunity mm -hmm. to have that same so thing stupid. and then pushed inside of a direction where I, it was... Um, Mm -hmm. Magnifying my talent. Okay. Well, magnifying see that—that's what my talent. mama did for me. That's what I'm talking about. That's what my mama like, did for me. You're better than this. Come on, let's get it right. No, let's no, get no. Right. That—that's—that's that's what my mama did for me. Listen. I—I I hear a lot of discipline in what you're saying when you were talking earlier. Oh, discipline for sure. Because and focus. Because you focus. were saying that y'all did this even when you weren't getting paid. Yeah. Up and you understood the assignment. No, absolutely. And here's the thing, and and I and I want to uh, establish this uh, so people will know, so that there's clarity there. I told my mother that I wanted to get involved in the entertainment industry. I voluntarily came to her after watching E.T. and looking at Drew Barrymore and all of them acting in that movie. And mm -hmm. I told her, I said, "Mom, I want I want to do that." Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that my mother was in a position where she was already an accomplished professional working within, you know, commercials in the jingle world and stuff like that in Chicago. She had connections, she had relationships. And so when I expressed that interest of wanting to get involved, my mother then supported me by, well, first of all, this is what she said to me. She said, well, if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. It's gonna require discipline it's going to require focus. It's going to require hard work. It's not just about acting silly when you get in front of a camera. This is a this is a job. This is a career. You will be thrust into an environment where you're working with adults, where you're working with professionals. They won't tolerate a kid being off the hinges. You know, like there was a whole week long conversation that me and my mother had leading up to like my first commercial audition and the reason why we had that was that first and foremost i didn't waste her time because she was working and paying bills and doing what she had to do to take care of me as a single mother but at the same time i think she was cognizant aware of the fact that she didn't want my childhood to be altered or for me to have some kind of negative experience being involved in the industry so she really wanted to make sure that I was sure that I knew what I was getting involved with. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was a lot of conversation. And even, um, you know, prior to going to auditions, because me and my mother would be coming up from the south side and south suburbs of Chicago, getting on the Dan Ryan Expressway. Anybody from Chicago know what the fuck I'm talking about with that? Getting on the Dan Ryan Expressway in the middle of rush hour to go downtown to audition for a role that's guaranteed you may not get. Only for you to, after your child doing that for a couple of hours, getting back in traffic to head back to the south side, only to, to have to prepare, get in the bed after making dinner, then you have to prepare your child to do homework, then you have to get yourself together in order for you to go up and get, get to work and do the same thing all over again. That's what my, what my mother did for me. Mm. There was a lot of sacrifice that, mm. that was put in. There was a lot of hard work. There was a lot of dedication and commitment from her. You know what I'm saying? 100%. The, the, the reason why I know how to prepare for an audition today, how I know how to conduct myself on set, 
how I know how to just be as a professional. I learned all from her. So she was working double time, handling her shit and preparing me for mine. Mm. So I owe everything to my mom. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Everything. That's, that's why, you know, when, when, she, when she asked for something, I'd be like, yeah. Even if some of the shit, I'd be like, you don't need that. But if she want it, she going to get it because... The reason why I got it is because she she prepared me to do it. She she put me in that space mentally, you know what I'm saying, and spiritually to where I was I was able to go out there and get it and attract it into our lives. So yeah, she can she can have whatever she want. Love you, mom. I'm not getting the new Mercedes that you wanted. We we, we gonna have to wait for that one. We'll get something else for right now, but because because man, she know how to ball, boy. She know how to ball. She know how to ball. Yeah. But I yeah. love her to death. That's my dog. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, my, my mom feels terrible mm. for not focusing it on, like, my talent. Because mm. she she used to talk me out of being an entertainer. Really? Yeah. Why? Um, Because I, I was born blind in my left eye, so she okay. just felt like, you know, you know, you, you, you handicapped. You can't, you can't, mm. people ain't going to, they, they not going to let you do this. It's not going to be easy for you. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it made me want to work harder to even try to not prove her wrong mm -hmm. i just could i wasn't good at nothing else i when i would go to school kids thought i was funny mm -hmm. so when i would watch like um in a living color or when i'm watching comic view or any of these shows def jam yeah. or something like that and whatnot and blah 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 I, and i was being inspired by eddie murphy movies from wayne's brothers and all all these people that i'm cool with now yeah yeah you know, um, but isn't that something though? It's not. If, if, if you don't mind me interjecting and saying this, everything happens for a reason. Mm. So, when your mother, when she was doing that back then, in her mind, she was protecting you. She was trying to protect me. And that's probably what needed to happen at that time because as a kid. But she was protecting me because she wanted to be a singer and she was too scared of the rejection she was getting oh. because she wasn't good enough. In her mind, she let people oh. tell her she wasn't good enough. She went to L.A. and my, my my dad was an actor, and people was telling him he wasn't good enough, and they quit. Again, they quit. but but protect that's protection. No, nah, listen. No, this was when a trauma buddy find another trauma buddy. Well, yeah, I mean that that listen, and it's your life, so yeah. I can't I can't sit up no, here. No, you you. Go ahead and diagnose. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna sit up here and try to dissect what has happened in your past experience. But I just know a lot of the times when parents do that, it does come from a place of trauma. And the one thing that they don't want to do, I think, is probably put their child in that same, in that same kind of situation, thinking mm -hmm. that their child will probably react the same way, if not maybe worse. But her not knowing, you built for this shit. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you have shown through your determination, mm -hmm. you have shown the world mm -hmm. and the universe that this is who you are and mm -hmm. what your purpose is because mm -hmm. you're here right now. Now, harking back on something that you said, even when you first brought this up, all of those people that you've watched throughout the course of your life in TV, including myself, we're all close friends now. We're friends. So all of that was meant to happen. I'm saying all that to say this. Things don't necessarily happen, and this is kind of a cliche kind of uh, quote now, but it but it's true. Things don't necessarily always happen when you want them to. Mm -hmm. They'll happen when it's time for them to happen in your life, when preparedness meets opportunity. And a lot of times, even with me, I've had to come to accept that, where I'll be like, well, man, I'm in this moment right now, deserve it right now, but then something will happen, and it may not work in my favor, but like, Five, six years later, something will happen. I'll look back in retrospect and be like, man, that wasn't meant for me. Mm -hmm. It was meant for me to do the prime example. And I'm going to share this quick story and I'll quit running my mouth. No, you, you're amazing. On the shy. Yeah. What a lot of people don't know is, is that I was cast originally as Ronnie in the shy. Get out of here. Years ago, before, like, when the shy was still just a pilot and Lena Waithe was still just you know, a uh, up and coming writer, you know, and producer coming up. Um, I had auditioned for that for the role of Ronnie in the shy, got it, shot the pilot in Chicago, 
waited six to seven months for Showtime to come back and say, well, we're going to pick up the show, but the original cast that we had with the show is not coming along with it. We're going to recast it. We're going to retool it. We're bringing in new directors, everything. They had dismantled the shy as a show as it was back then, and it built up a whole new show, whole new cast. And I was like, oh, shit, that had never happened to me before in my career, ever. I, it it had kind of knocked me off my square a little bit. It had kind of fucked with my ego. Made me a little bit insecure as an actor. And here's what I will say, too, uh, so nobody will think my sister Lena was on some bullshit with me. It wasn't that. It wasn't her decision. It was the network's decision. No, all the time, yeah. They they had a vision for the show, and being that Lena was still kind of young and still kind of green in, in their eyes, this was them, you know, pulling, you know, pulling a move like, no, you're going to do this our way right now. And, you know, if it works and we continue to go on, then we'll listen to you a little bit more. Right. So she called me and she said, brother, I know you've gotten the news because my manager at the time called me. I, I'll never forget. I was sitting at a bar looking at college football. I was at six feet under on 11th Street. I will never fucking forget this day. I was looking at a Bama game and my phone rang. And it was my manager. And so I answered the phone. I was like, hey, what's up? She says, hey, Jason, so listen, we just heard back from, you know, Showtime. So I got good news and I got bad news. And I was like, okay, well, give me the good news. She was like, well, the good news is the show got picked up. I was like, okay, that's great. She said, well, the bad news is you're not going along for the ride. They're recasting the whole show. And my stomach, like, caved in into my spine. And I was just sitting there like, Wow. And I sat there for a moment. I let it sink in. And this is a true story. Right hand to God. And I heard in my spirit, in here, God telling me, it ain't time yet. And in my mind, I was like, the fuck you mean it ain't time? Like, I just, <laughs> Lord, forgive me. I mean, you know the talk we had. But I was like, the fuck you mean? Like, it's time now. I earned this role. I auditioned for it. And I'm from the shot. I'm from Chicago. We just shot the pilot. I know I did my thing in the pilot. Why not now? That was my question. Why not now? Fast forward, had a conversation with Lena. She told me, she said, brother, just let me do this the way. And I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this conversation, that the conversation that she and I had. But it, this is real. It's a testament to her character, actually. She said, brother, I know this doesn't feel right. I know it's not fair, but I'm coming back for you. Just let me do this show the way they want me to do it. Let me build it up. I promise you, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I don't know if, it, if it's even going to be this show or another show. But when I get there, I'm coming back for you. Fast forward. Five years later, I get a call from my attorney, Joshua Edwards. He's like, hey, what's up, man? It's just regular comments. He's like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, what's up? He said, yo, have you auditioned for The Shy recently or something? I was like, no, not that I know of. He's like, why? He said, well, we just got an offer in. Not even, a, 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 you know, somebody asking if I was available to audition. We got an offer in for this character for Rashad that they want you to play. It starts da-da-da-da-da. You'll be in Chicago, and it's a reoccurring role. It's like... It's a guest appearance, but yeah, it's a straight up offer. Now, I share that story with you and with everyone else here and everyone else who's watching this show. I share that story to show you that it's about timing. Everything is about timing. That role of Ronnie that I originally got wasn't meant for me. It was meant for that actor. Confirmation for that is that character was killed off. That character been gone. A, a terrible death. Terrible death. That, terrible that death. That was the stupidest death I've ever seen terrible in my fucking life death. in TV. Terrible death. Now, and here's the irony. Hey, Ronnie. No, no, no. What the? That's no. how y'all gonna do it? That, no, but 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 no, Ronnie. I mean, after Ronnie killed uh, a kid, yeah, he. I mean, that that had to happen. 
But the irony. They, they could have made it a little bit more creative. Well, you know what? You tell Lena that. I ain't finna tell her that shit. No, I'm trying to work I, I, next shit. I'm, so I'm trying to get you Lena to put that. me Lena, in some you shit. This nigga? Hey, Lena, I'm just bullshit. He got suggestions. No, that was the shit. He that got was the notes. shit. Y'all killed, y'all killed running the right he way, Lena. He got notes. Yeah, yeah. I, and I love Slim and um, the other uh, girl, too. <laughs> Slim and the girl. Yeah. But no, here, here's the full circle moment. That yeah. Even that character that killed Ronnie, mm. um, Bakari. Yes, Bakari went on I, to... My character is mentoring that kid now. Now, on the show. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, yeah. you know, I just want people to take that into account um, as it relates to their lives and, and how they move forward, whether you're in the industry or not. This is just, this is, is applicable to life in general. Mm -hmm. When it's your time, it's your time. Just continue to walk in your purpose, feel, feeling confident in knowing that one day it will happen. And as you are waiting and you're in that holding pattern and you're seeing others go before you, living out their moment, be happy for them because they've gone through probably the same thing you've gone through. They're on their journey and they've dealt with their ups and downs and they've dealt with their rejection mm. and they've dealt with their hardships. We all go through it. Mm. So while you're waiting for your moment, be patient and be confident in knowing that your time will come and be happy for others when their time comes. And I guarantee you, when your time comes, you will step into your blessing and it will be yours and nobody will be able to take it away because it's written. And that's real shit. That's real shit. I think a lot of people, if they would... I'm about to go thrill no, if they would embrace that philosophy, you would you would get a lot less haters out here, man. Like niggas be hating because they don't see no light at the end of the tunnel. Cause in their mind, they can't see no pot at the end of the rainbow, no gold pot at the end of the rainbow. So when they see you having yours, that's when you get a hater. I don't think people are just inherently just evil like that. I think it's just developed over time, just from you know seeing things and other people's experiences and comparing them to yours and. Then all of a sudden you're looking like, well, I ain't got shit. And why he got it or why she got it? That's why you have like that kind of that kind of energy that gets out there from time to time. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm and I'm specifically speaking to the young people out there who are like trying to come up and, and do their thing. Be happy for others, man. And just wait your turn. Cause it'll come and keep planting good seeds. That good seed that you planted, even if it's just like a positive gesture, even if it's something small as opening up a door for somebody or giving somebody an inspiring word on the street, even when you feel you ain't got nothing to give. I'm telling you, man, that energy transfers over. That energy comes back around full circle. And before you know it, something will happen in your life where you'd be like, damn, I didn't see that coming. What a blessing. And it's because you've sown good into the world. And that's when you'll receive it. So that that's just, I'm telling you, it, it works. I live by it every day, and not every day is fucking roses and peaches and cream. But you know what? When I have my moments, man, it be some real shit where all I can do is get on my knees and thank God. Moments, <laughs> moment, moments that I've had, man, where I've been like, I didn't see that coming. Or where did that solution to that problem come from? How did that happen? It's all because along the way leading up to that moment, some good seeds were like planted in the ground. And that's all you got to do, man. That's all you got to do. And I'm telling you, when your time come, it will happen. Look at Jack. Look at Jack, y'all. Real shit. Jack been doing this for a long time. Jack is a funny motherfucker. We all been knowing this for years. We've been seeing Jack on the grind for years, whether it's on stage, whether it's on Wildin' Out. We've been watching him for years. There's been other comedians that have come along and have maybe had their moment sooner than his or whatever. But let me tell you, He's worked consistently. He's kept his head down. He never complains. He builds the relationships. And now you've seen him expand and blow up, having relationships with, with niggas. I can't even hardly get on the phone. I can't get Marlon Wayans and Sean Wayans on the phone. And I did a movie with Marlon. As a matter of fact, can you put me in contact with Marlon? I need to holler at him. But anyway, I'm saying all that to say this. Like, now Jack is in his moment. But it just, it just took time. It just took time. Yeah, hook, hook me up, man. Marlon, why don't you answer the phone, though, bro? Like, I've been calling you, nigga. And I know you got new shows and shit going on. 
What's up, player? <laughs> but man, he just love you. This nigga just be <laughs> anything Jack does. This nigga just. <laughs> Damn, they're falling out the chair. Y'all niggas been on drink champs together and all that shit. I did a fucking Coen Brothers movie with this nigga. And they talking to him ah! since we rapped on set. I ain't talked to Marlon Wayne since we rapped on set. He said, man, it was nice working with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck is that? Nigga, I'm trying to get that Wayne's paper. <laughs> you feel me? You feel me, Jack? Man. <laughs> Holy man. shit. Oh man, yo, yo, Jason, man, I got so much more shit I want to ask and uh, talk to you about, man. But and see, I, I can you... run my mouth though, man. That that'll be a whole four hour conversation. I can come back another time, man. You, I really, I really. You, would you come back? Of course. Well, Jack, you my you my friend, man. So you know. And, and, and so listen, man. So we finna we uh, I'm I'm ready to write now. Let's okay. put some projects together, man, and. Uh, Let's take it to the moon. Let's I, write. Let's write something and see if Marlon will help us get over the finish line. Yeah, one hundred percent. You give him a call. One. See if he'll do it if you call. One hundred percent. Hey, he, he owed me a couple for a couple different reasons. Oh, he does. No, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just playing too with Marlon. Marlon's actually a great guy. At that, that's my dog. I just always give him a hard time because I'd be like, Marlon, when we gonna work together? Y'all did a Coen's Brothers movie. We did the Lady Killers together. Wow. Okay. Um. My my um the role the role that I played in that um We Mac Funthus, that was the character's name. That was the character that got Marlon's character in the casino. I mm. worked as a janitor. Mm. And so I was the one that gave Marlon's character a tour of the casino to where he could map out the plans to where they could rob the casino. Okay. So I only worked for one day um on that on that film. But man, what a what an experience to work with Marlon. Um, that was the first time I got a chance to to really see him work as like a serious actor, a serious thespian. Because prior to that, you know, I just seen him on the Wayans Brothers, and you know, I think I saw him in Requiem for a Dream or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, I knew he had chops, but that was the first time I had had the opportunity um, to work opposite with him and kind of check his his method. You know what I'm saying, and how he gets in a character. So that was that was dope. Uh, and then working with Joel and Ethan Cohen, that man, man, that's another. Hey, Joel, Ethan, if y'all happen to see Jack's show, what's up, man? Hey, we gonna send another one. We're going to send it to him. Please send this to Joel and Ethan. Joel, Ethan, I'm here, baby. And you know I can get down. Come on, man. Dig, dig. Man. Jason, man. Hey, thank you for coming through the New Jack Thriller City show, man. This is the oh uh, now I know you gonna be on the album and you we're gonna write some shit together. Yes, we we're are. We're gonna take it to the moon and whatnot. Yes, we are. Um, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about your future. I'm excited about mine. I'm excited about the future of this city. All the young talent that's down here. I'm excited about us as black creators and other creators, people of color, who are now telling their stories, um, and who are unapologetically presenting their stories now as they should have, but never got the opportunity to do it. This is an exciting town. This is a renaissance we're in the middle of right now. A true black renaissance in the digital, the digital age. And we can get it and we can make the money. We can monetize it. Nobody has to take anything from us. All we gotta do is just stick together and work hard. That's it. Man, Jason. That is in a nutshell, right there, dog. In a nutshell. Hey, man, we finna bring you back, man. That, that this, this, this is this is it. It just makes sense. Make it a part two. Bring me on back, Jack. I love you. I, I love, love you back. I love what you're doing. Um, you always got my support, man. You really, really do, cause you one of the guys out here that has a good heart. You're a genuine person, and everybody that you encounter, you know, you always leave them with a with a warm impression, man. And that says a lot about your spirit and about your character and who you are as a man. So that's why I fuck with you, dog. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, with that being said, hey, yo, DJ Wiz. Hey, man, go on here to take us out. Let's go.